for the departed souls of all the mu'mineen and mu'minat, especially the shuhada, and especially those innocent mourners of Imam Hussein alayhi salam who were martyred in the last couple of days in Afghanistan and Pakistan, and their sole crime being that they were remembering the tragedy of what befell Imam Hussein and his family and his companions. Please recite Surah Al-Fatiha. الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين إنه خير ناصر ومعين ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وخاتم النبيين وسيد المرسلين أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين ولعنة الله الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين من يومنا هذا إلى قيام يوم الدين <تصفيق> أعظم الله أجورنا وأجوركم بمصابنا بالحسين عليه السلام May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala magnify our reward and your reward for our remembering and commemorating and grieving over Imam Hussein alayhi salam and he, may he place us among those who will seek revenge for that blood that was spilled, that was spilled alongside the Imam of the time. There was a companion by the name of Ibn Shabib. Ibn Shabib was a companion of our eighth Imam. And one day he enters into the presence of the Imam, eighth Imam alayhi salam, in the beginning of the month of Muharram. And the Imam alayhi salam wishes to instruct him regarding the importance of the day of Ashura. So what he tells him is, يَا بْنَ الشَّبِيبِ إِن كُنْتَ بَاكِيًا لِشَيْءٍ O Shabib, if you are going to cry for anything, فَأَبْكِي لِلْحُسَيْنِ بْنِ عَلِي بْنِ أَبِي طَالِمٍ O oh, Ibn Shabib, if you're going to cry for anything, then let your tears be for Hussein, the son of Ali, the son of Abi Talim. فَإِنَّهُ ذُبِحَ كَمَا ذُبِحَ الْكَبَشْ وَقُتِلَ مَعَهُ مِنْ أَهْلِ بَيْتِهِ ثَمَانِيَةُ عَشَرَ رَجُلًا مَا لَهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ شَبِيهُونَ if you're going to weep over anything, then weep for Hussein ibn Ali. For indeed he was slaughtered the same way they slaughtered the sheep. And along with him, 18 members of his family were killed. 
Never has the, never has the earth witnessed anybody like them. And then later on he goes on to say, يَبْنَ الشَّبِيب إِنْ بَكَيْتَ عَلَى الْحُسَيْنِ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ حَتَّى تَصِيرَ دُمُوعُكَ عَلَى خَدَّيْكَ O Ibn Shabib, if you were to cry upon Hussein, such that your tears roll down your cheeks, غَفَرَ اللَّهُ لَكَ كُلَّ ذَنْبٍ أَذْنَبْتَهُ صَغِيرًا أكان أو كبيرا قليلا كان أو كثيرا. If you were to cry such that the tears would roll down your cheeks, then Allah would forgive you all your sins, whether they be small or whether they be big, whether they be many or whether they be little. Brothers and sisters, <coughs> inshallah, <coughs> I would like to. <clears throat> go through the story of what happened to Imam Hussein Islam on this day. But before that, I'd like to spend some of the time that's been allocated to do a little bit of understanding and analysis as to what is the reason why we're crying and how, is, how these tears can help us. And you might say that, okay, the other 10 days of the month, the other 9 days of the month can be used for analysis and learning. But on this day, let's just cry. Let's just go through the story and let the tears fall. And I won't say that that's something which is wrong or something which is incorrect. But I think we have a precedence here. If we go back to the battle of Jamal, in the book of Tawheed, Sheikh Sadduq reports that the battle was taking place. Imam Ali Islam was planning the battle strategy against the enemy. And in the midst of the war strategy planning, this one Bedouin Arab comes to him. And he asks him a question about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the companions around Imam Ali Islam are upset at this. They say that, okay, what, is, this, is, this, is this a time to ask a question? Is this a time for learning? Can't you see that Amir al-Mu'mineen is busy and his mind is occupied with planning the battle strategy? But Imam Ali alayhi tells him, he tells his companions, دَعُوهُ فَإِنَّ الَّذِي يُرِيدُهُ الْأَعْرَابِ هُوَ الَّذِي نُرِيدُهُ مِنَ الْقَوْمِ Leave him alone, my friends, my companions. Because what this Bedouin Arab wants is after all what we want from the people. What the Ahlul Bayt Islam want from the people is not just battle for the sake of battle. It's battle for the sake of establishing Tawheed. What they want from the tears that we shed is not tears just for the sake of tears. But it's tears for the sake of something greater and something more noble. And so I'd like to spend a few minutes seeing if we can address this question with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then inshallah we'll return to the story of Imam Hussein. The question is, what is the point of these tears? What can we do with them? How can they help us? I want to address this question by looking at three different incidents that took place in Karbala and seeing what we can learn from them. Incident number one took place with, it's regarding this man named Ubaidullah ibn al-Hur al-Ju'fi. Ubaidullah ibn al-Hur, as you know, was somebody who was trying to avoid the imam as the imam was making his way towards the shahada. But it so happened that at one point his tent was pitched near the tent of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Now brothers and sisters, we're giving these stories here, but we have to ask ourselves that when it comes time for the imam of our time to ask us for help, well, how are we going to respond? The Imam finds out that Ubaidullah ibn Hur has pitched his tent near the tent of the Imam. He goes to see Ubaidullah. And he invites him to join him in his mission. Ubaidullah tells him that this is actually the moment I was fearing. I was trying to avoid you on this entire journey. But now that you've asked me, I have to tell you no. I can't join you. 
I don't wish to join you, but here is my sword and here is my horse. Please take these and use them. Imam Ali responds to him, إِذَا بَخِلْتَ إِذَا بَخِلْتَ عَلَيْنَا بِنَفْسِكَ فَلَا حَاجَةَ لَنَا بِمَالِكَ if you're going to be miserly and you're going to withdraw and refrain from giving us yourself, O oh, Ubaidullah, then we have no need of your sword and your horse. And the Imam departs. When we look at this example of Ubaidullah, we can see that there's a certain mentality that somebody like him had, and God forbid that we should have the same mentality. Sometimes people when they do good acts, especially acts relating to the Ahlul Bayt, they feel like they're doing a favor to the Ahlul Bayt Let me take some time out of my busy schedule and do a favor to Imam Hussein by shedding some tears for him. Let me do the Imam a favor by paying my khums. Let me do Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a favor by going for hajj. But this is a perspective which is not correct. The Imam salam, doesn't want gifts and favors from us. He wants us to submit ourselves to his command. That is the calling that the Imam has for his Shia. That they should submit themselves to the command of the Imam salam. And anything that we do that falls short of that, anytime we perceive that somehow we're doing a favor, we miss the point. Because when the Imam salam, wants us for himself, it's not so that he can get something out of us, it's for our own benefit. If we have the tawfiq to shed tears for the Ahlul Bayt, that's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not some favor that we've done to Allah or the Ahlul Bayt. If we have the tawfiq to be able to come to the center and attend the programs and learn, that's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not a favor that we're doing to him. And the only way that we can achieve anything meaningful out of this short time that we're here in this world is by submitting to the command of the Imam, submitting to the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manifested in the calling of the Imam of our time and then seeing where he takes us and seeing where he leads us. A second lesson that we learn from the story of Ubaidullah is that when it comes to the submission that we are called to have, it's not something that should be just multi, just single dimensional. Here he is thinking that, okay, the Imam salam, can make use of his war <coughs> items, his sword and his horse. What about his wealth? What about his time? What about his moral support? What about his knowledge? What about his ability to lead people? All these things were things that he should have been willing to sacrifice and give to the Imam of his time. But he selectively chose a couple of things and said, okay, Imam, this is for you. Sometimes, unfortunately, people like myself, and I tell, address these, these lessons to myself first and then to all the mu'mineen and mu'minat. Sometimes we have a tendency of being there when it comes to some part of Islam. But we're not holistic Muslims. Amir al-Mu'mineen salam is reported to have said, Rubba mutanassikin la deena lahu. How often we have somebody who's very good at performing the acts of worship, the namaz, the worship, the, the psalm. But he doesn't have any religion. Why doesn't he have any religion, O Mawla? Because when it comes to the rest of those things that God asks of him, when it comes to the way he deals with his family, when it comes to the way he deals with the society, when, he, when it comes to his being aware of the times, he has no deen. We have to learn to become holistic Muslims. Peace be upon Allah, Muhammad. The second story is from the life and times of somebody named Ad-Dahak. Ad-Dahak, the son of Abdullah al-Mashriqi. Ad-Dahak was somebody who met the Imam salam during the on the way to Karbala. And the Imam salam invites him to join him. Dahak thinks about it. He's there with his cousin. His cousin refuses to join the Imam. He says, I, I have things to attend to. I'm a little bit elderly right now, so please excuse me. The Imam says, okay, fine. The Haq, however, thinks about it. He says that, okay, Imam, I'm going to join you, but on a condition. My condition is that I'll be with you until 
there's no hope for your being successful. At that point, I'll take your permission and I'll leave. The Imam Islam agrees to this condition. We see that the Haq, the son of Abdullah al-Mashriqi, was with the Imam the entire 10 days. Even in the morning of the day of Ashura, he's with the Imam. Even as there are slight skirmishes that take place, he's with the Imam. Even until the Dhuhr prayers, he's with the Imam. And then we see that he's doing a bit of fighting as well too. But he's fighting on feet, on his foot, on foot. After a bit of fighting though, he goes to the Imam Ali he tells him that, Oh Imam, remember that time that I joined you, I asked you, and I put a condition on my service to you. So will you give me that permission to leave you right now? The Imam Ali says, yes, you go ahead. But how are you going to escape? The enemy has surrounded us. He says that I have a horse that I've hidden in one of the tents. I'll use that horse and I'll escape. So the hawk gets on the horse and then he rushes and leaves Karbala and goes away. And later on he becomes one of those individuals from, who reports what took place in detail on the day and leading up to the day of Ashura. Now the Haq was somebody who you might say did a better service than obeyed Allah. At least he joined the Imam He joined him but we see that even in the example of obeyed Allah there are some faults. After all we have to ask ourselves when he's leaving the camp of Imam Hussain can he not hear the children crying? Could you not see that these women were about to be left without any helpers? What sort of responsibility did he see himself having with respect to the Imam Why was he so fearful? What is he so scared about? Did he not take a lesson from Hazrat Ali Akbar Hazrat Ali Akbar on the way to Karbala when Imam Hussain Hussain receives a special dream in which he sees that and understands that death is coming to them soon. He begins to say, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Ali Akbar alayhi salam goes to him and he says, Oh my father, lima starja'ata? Oh, why are you saying this formula of istirja? The Imam alayhi salam answers him, tells him that we are going to die soon. What is the response of Ali Akbar alayhi salam? He says that, Oh my father, afalasna ala al-haq, are we doing the right thing? Are we doing our responsibility? The Imam alayhi salam responds to him, Bala ya bunay, wallahi alladhi ilayhi marji'ul ibad. Yes, I swear by God, my son, my dear son, we are doing the right thing by that Lord to whom we will all return. So then Hazrat Ali Akbar says that إِذَنْ لَا نُبَالِي بِالْمَوْتِ We're not going to be worried about moat. We're not going to be worried about death. The lesson that we learn from this brothers and sisters is that if we are doing our responsibility, there is no cause for fear. There's no cause for fear. The t responsibility of Ali Akbar and the responsibility of the Haq was to fight until they received Shahada. Our responsibility in these times is something different. Our responsibility may be to raise children. Our responsibility may be to gain an education. Our responsibility may be to raise a family, to gain knowledge, to, further, to purify ourselves, whatever it may be. But as long as we're doing our responsibility, there is no cause for fear. So if it's the case that we see that Muslims right now are fearing the practice of Islam, then they haven't taken the lesson from Karbala. This is the time, in fact, that we need to assert ourselves as citizens of this country. There's nothing to hide. We're citizens just like anybody else. And in fact, our country is in need of our teachings and our teachings of Tawheed more, at, more than it's ever been ever before. And if we are the ones who are going to hide and not practice and be scared of what other people are going to say about, about the way we dress and the way we act and the way we conduct ourselves at this time, then we can be sure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't wait for us. He'll bring somebody else to carry on the message of Tawheed and the message of Islam. There's no need to fear. We belong in this country. The other example and lesson we learned from the Haq 
is that there are some Muslims who are Muslims until the day of Ashura. They're with the community, they're with the Imam when it comes to the days of Ashura, but when it comes time for Ashura after that, the Haq goes his own way. Imam al Islam, this is my condition, it's on my terms how I want to serve you. I'm going to serve until the day of Ashura. Why should we take the same example? Shouldn't we do something else? Peace be salat ala Muhammad. The last example is the example of Hur ibn Yazid al Riyahi. Hur is somebody who, when he submits to the command of the Imam of his time, there are no conditions. There are no restrictions, there is no single dimension to his submission and his readiness. When he realizes the truth, history reports that he begins to shake. And they tell him that, oh Hur, you are the bravest of the Kufans, why are you shaking? And he says, he says that I see myself deciding between paradise and the fire of hell. And then he spurs his horse forward, according to some reports, he puts his hands up in a sign of submission. This brave warrior has to assume this sign of submission and pleading. He makes his way to the Imam Islam saying, Allahumma, Allahumma, ilayka unibu fatub alay. Oh Allah, I repent to you and I turn to you, so accept my repentance. Faqad ar'abtu for indeed I have caused terror to enter the hearts of your special friends and the children of your Prophet. And then he goes to his Imam and he says, Yabna Rasulullah, min tawba, oh the Messenger of Allah, is there any way that my acceptance, my repentance will be accepted? The Imam immediately responds by saying, Qad taballahu alayhi. Allah has accepted your repentance, and then Hur goes to perform his responsibility. Brothers and sisters, the lesson that we get from this is a lesson of tawbah and tawassul. Here we are shedding tears over others and what they've done. Should we not shed tears over ourselves? Is this not an opportunity for us to think about the crimes that we've committed? And to turn to the Imam of our time and ask him the same question, oh, Imam al-Zaman, O oh, Sahib al-Zaman, Halli min tawbah, is there any way that I can, my, my tawbah can be accepted? This is an opportunity, this is hope, brothers and sisters. We should never let anybody tell us that we're somehow limited. This is the example of Hur that he is told by the Imam of his time, Anta hurran kama sammatka ummuk fid dunya wal akhir, O oh, Hur, you indeed are a free person just like your mother has named you in this world and the hereafter. Who's to say that we should be anywhere less than Hur? Can we not even rise higher than Hur? Inna Allah la yanzur. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't look to the wealth that you have or to your, the color of your skin. Walakin yanzur ila qulubikum wa ila a'amalikum. He looks at your heart and your taqwa. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is looking for us. The day of Ashura is a day of sadness, but it's a day of hope for us as well too. A day of renewal, a day of recommitment. It's a day of telling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Imam that, oh, I'm an Abd. I, my master is Abu Abdullah al Hussein. He is Abu Abdullah, the one who is the servant of Allah. I too am a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sallu ala Muhammad. <coughs> Sallallahu alayka ya Aba Abdillah صلى الله عليك يا ابن فاطمة الزهراء. We're told in a tradition reported by Alama Majlisi. 
He says, when the Prophet told Sayyida Fatima about what's going to happen to her son Hussein and all the difficulties he's going to have to face. The tradition says, Bakat Fatima to Baka and Shadida. Fatima began to weep profusely. And she says to, his fa to her father, Where will we be when this will happen to Hussein? He tells her that we will not be there at that time, nor will Ali be there. She begins to cry even more, and she says, Who is going to mourn over him, O oh, my father? He tells her, Don't worry, my daughter. There will always be women and men from my ummah, generation after generation, year in and year out. That on the day of Ashura, they will mourn for your son Hussein. And oh my daughter, on the day of Qiyamah, you and I will be those who intercede on their behalf. And then he goes on to say, Ya Fatima tu, O oh Fatima, Kullu aynin bakiyatun yawm al-qiyamati illa aynun bakat ala musab al Every eye will be crying on the day of judgment, except that eye and those eyes would shed tears about what happened to Hussein. <clears throat> on the day of Ashura, when the standard bearer of Imam Hussein salam was martyred, Imam Hussein salam turns to see that there is no one left to help him against the enemy. He looks and he sees his family members and companions lying slaughtered on the ground. He hears the wailing of the orphans and the cries of the children. He calls out as loud as he can, Ama min mughithin yughithuna, Ama min mujirin yujiruna. Is there anyone who defends the sanctity of the Messenger of Allah? Is there anyone who can come to our rescue? According to one report, iltafat al Husaynu an yaminihi. Imam Hussein looks at his right, he sees no one is there to help him. He looks towards his left and he sees there is no one left among the men to come to his support. But suddenly he sees there is somebody who is coming out from the tent. His son Ali ibn al Hussein Zain al Abidin alayhi salam is leaning on a cane and dragging his sword in the ground. He was so sick that he could hardly move, but when Hussein alayhi salam sees him, he calls upon his sister Umm Kulthum. He tells her, O oh, Umm Kulthum, Ihbisihi. Don't let him come out into the battlefield. Let there never be a case when this earth is left without any representative of the family of Muhammad. She goes out and she takes Imam Zainul Abidin salam back into the tent. At this point, after Imam Hussein salam sacrifices his baby son, he turns to his camp. He knows that it is time to bid farewell. He cries out, Ya Zainab, Ya Umm Kulthum, Ya Sakina, Ya Ruqayya, Ya Fatima, Alaykunna min salam He sees, however, that Sukaina alayha salam cannot bear the separation from her father. She has separated herself from the rest of the women who are mourning and crying. He asks her, O oh, Sukaina, what is so wrong with you? She tells him, O oh, my father, are you getting ready for death? He tells her, how can somebody who has no one to help him, no one to turn to, do anything but prepare for death? He tells him, Oh my father, if that's the case, can you please send me back to the haram of my grandfather, the messenger of Allah. Find some way that we can go back to Medina, to our home in Medina. But Imam Hussain tells her, Oh Sakina, oh my daughter, 
How can I possibly do that given the enemy has surrounded us? He summons his son Imam Zain al-Abidin to him. He gives him that knowledge necessary that Imam of the time passes to the next Imam of the time. He gives him all the precious items that were inherited from the Prophet Imam Ali alayhi salam. And then he begins to say repeatedly, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi al-ali al-azim. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم. Imam Hussein is now advancing towards the enemy. He raises his sword, challenges them to hand-on-hand -hand combat. No one who accepts this challenge can kill him. They are greedy to get that war booty from Umaydullah ibn Ziyad. But they don't know that they are fighting the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib. They can do nothing to stop him. Then he charges the enemy army's east flank. And he recites this poetry, Al Mawla Awla Min Rukub Al Ari, Wal Aru Awla Min Dukhul Al Nar. But they cannot stop him from the right side. Then he goes to the left side and he calls out the battle cry, An Al Hussein ibn Ali, Alay to Allah, Anthony, Ahmi Iyalati Abi, Amdi Aladin al Nabi. If you don't know me, I'm Hussein, the son of Ali. I will never ever bow and bend to their wishes. I will protect my father's family and remain on the Prophet's creed. 4,000 arrows were fought at Imam Hussein alayhi salam. 4,000 arrows were fought at the Imam of the time. He's forced to come down from his horse. And then he sees that four horsemen have surrounded him and they are separating him from the tents. He knows what is on their mind. He, know what's the, he knows what they want to do. He shouts out at them, O oh, followers of Abu Sufyan, Ya Shi'ata Ali Abi Sufyan, In lam yakun lakun deen. If you have no religion, Wala takhafun al ma'ad, and you don't fear the fire of hell, Fakunu ahraran fi dunyakum. At least be free people in this life. Shimmer tells him, Oh, the son of Fatima, what are you saying? He says, I am the one who is fighting you. I am the one who is fighting you. The women are innocent. Keep your men away from them and don't harm my women as long as I am alive. Shimmer agrees to this request of the Imam alayhi salam. Now the ladies know that this time is near when they will lose the Imam. They will lose their father, their brother, their uncle. They begin to surround him, they hold on to his clothes, the children are crying. They're stunned by the situation as they realize what is happening. Some of them are begging for his protection, other ones are begging for some water. It is at this time that Umar ibn Sa'd says to his men, will, will be to you, this is the time. Attack him now when he's with his women and his children. If he were to pay attention to you, there's no way you can stop him. At this point, they begin to fire arrows on the tents of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Some of these arrows actually pierce through the clothes of some of the women. And they are so frightened and stunned by what has happened. They start screaming and they enter the tents. Imam Hussein alayhi salam attacks the enemy like an angry lion. No one can catch up with him, but he's receiving arrows from all directions. How long can he last? He keeps on saying, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi al-ali al-azim. He asks them for some water from them. They say that you shall not have any water until you reach the fire. Imam Hussein alayhi salam curses those who said this to him. But finally, he can fight no longer. He stands to rest. A man takes a stone in his hand. فَرَمَاهُ رَجُلٌ بِحَجَرٍ عَلَى جِبْهَتِهِ He takes this stone and hurls it at the forehead of the Imam. The stone hits the forehead of the Imam. Blood, causes, blood begins to rush down his face. He takes his shirt to wipe the blood from his face, but then another man fires a three-pronged arrow at his chest. The arrow hits the heart of the Imam alayhi salam. Imam immediately calls out, Bismillahi wa billahi wa ala millati rasulillah. He falls down to the ground. He calls to the heavens, Ilahi innaka ta'lamu annahum yaqtuluna rajula. 
Oh my Lord, you know they are killing a man besides whom there is no other son of your prophet's daughter. He then puts his hand to the blood which is on his face and he rubs it on his face and his beard. He says that this is the way I'm going to meet my Lord and my grandfather, the messenger of Allah. I shall complain to my grandfather, the prophet. I'll tell him, Ya Jaddi. Oh my grandfather, these are the ones who have killed me. But the Imam salam is not completely alone. Some of the children are peering out from the edges of the tents to see what is happening to their uncle. One of them is Abdullah, the son of Imam Hassan alayhi salam. Abdullah is the brother of Qasim. Abdullah is seeing that the enemies have surrounded his uncle. Abdullah is just a young child. But he can, cannot contain himself anymore. When he sees his uncle having no helper, he comes running towards him. Zainab salamullahi alayha realizes the danger. She tries to restrain him from going to his uncle. Imam Hussein alayhi salam sees from the corner of his eye that his nephew is coming to him. He cries out, Oh Zainab, Ahdisihi ya ukhti. Don't let him come to me, my sister. But she is unable to contain him. Abdullah goes to his father. He sees that there is one enemy who is about to strike him with his sword. He tells him, Yabn al atabribu ammi. Oh, the son of the ugly person, are you going to strike my uncle? And then he raises his arm to protect his uncle against the strike of this enemy. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi al-ali al-azim. But that man strikes with his sword. The sword falls upon the hand of Abdullah, the son of Hassan. He cries out, Oh, my mother! His mother is waiting for him in the tent. And then he falls into the lap of Hussein. Imam Hussein hugs him to himself and he said, Oh my nephew, be patient. Isbir ala ma nazala bik. Wahda sabbi thalik al khair. Fa inna Allah ta'ala yuhikuka bi abaik al salihin. Don't worry, Allah will cause you to join with your fathers and your righteous ancestors. And then an arrow comes from the enemy soldiers. This enemy comes and strikes Abdullah, the son of Hassan. This arrow is from the bow of Hurmala, la'anatullahi alayhi. Imam Hussein alayhi salam remains, remains lying on the ground for some time. According to some report, three hours, Imam Hussein alayhi salam is lying on the ground. No one can dare to go strike the Imam and put an end to the situation. Every tribe is telling the other tribe that you do it, no, you do it. According to one report, one of the enemy soldiers went to do this, but he sees that this Imam alayhi salam is so beautiful. He says, فَوَاللَّهِ مَا رَأَيْتُ قَطُّ قَتِيلًا I've never seen anybody who's ever been killed, drowned in his blood, be so beautiful as this Imam. The light is shining from his face. The beauty of him and his thought is coming forward. I lost the ability to go and kill him. But when Imam Hussein's condition worsens, he raises his eyes to the heavens and he talks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, Sabran ala qadaika ya Rabb. La ilaha siwaak. Ya Mustaghithin. I am patient upon what you decree, my Lord. There is no one worthy of worship but you, or the one who comes to help for those who are in distress. Zainab Salamullahi Alayha knows that the end is near. She comes out crying from the tents, O oh, Muhammad. Wa Muhammada, wa Abata, wa Aliya, wa Ja'afara, wa Hamzata. Hadha Husaynun bil Arai, Dari'un bi Karbala. Here is Hussein in the open, about to be slain in Karbala. She sees that Umar ibn Sa'd has come with a special group of elite soldiers to put an end to the situation. 
She turns to Omar ibn Sa'd and she tells him, Oh Omar, ayyuqtalu Abu Abdullah wa anta tanzuru ilayhi. Are you going to allow Abu Abdullah, my brother, to be killed? And you're just watching that happen. He looks at her, he begins to cry. He turns his face away from her. He cannot respond to Zainab. She calls out to the enemy, Woe unto you. وَيْهَكُمْ أَمَا فِيكُمْ مُسْلِمْ Is there no Muslim among you? Would any Muslim allow such a thing to happen? Umar ibn Sa'ad tells his men, put an end to it. Shimmer advances. First he kicks the imam with his foot. And then he sits down on the blessed chest of the imam. He takes hold of the holy beard of the imam. This man Shimmer is taking hold of the beard of the imam of his time. <laughs> imam alayhi salam tells him, Ya waylaka man anta, wo be to you, who are you? Faqad irtaqayta martaqan azima. You have a light of it upon a very blessed mountain. But Shimmer knows no mercy. He begins to strike. Zainab is watching him. Maybe she is thinking to herself as he is severing the head of her brother. She is severing her hope that her brother will live anymore. <laughs> the horse of Imam Hussein al-Islam makes its way back to the tents. The women are waiting to see what's going to happen. Sakina is waiting to see what happened to her father. She is hoping that maybe her father has come back on the horse, but she sees that there is no rider on the horse. She knows that this is now the end. Her father has fallen. They begin to cry out saying, Wa Husayna, Wa Muhammada. But Sakina has only one question for this horse of her father. She addresses it saying, Ya Jawada Abi. هَلْ سُقِيَ أَبِي أَمْ قُتِلَ عَتَشَانَا Tell me one thing. Tell me one thing. When my father was killed, did he die in a state of thirst or did they give him some water? أَلَا لَعَنَةُ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْقَوْمِ الظَّالِمِينَ وَسِعَنَمُ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا أَيَّمُ الْفَلَدِينَ